Yeah. So that you you were mentioning that you were beginning to notice the aversion <clears throat> quality to old behaviors. But now you recognize what's driving those behaviors is this sense of dissatisfaction or mm-hmm. unsatisfactoriness. Uh, you called it aversion. Yeah. That you don't like it. So that's the feeling of, of what's going on, is, is there's that, that underlying feeling that when we are aware of it, we can deal with it or manage it correctly and properly. But when we're not aware of it, it drives our life. Mm. Yep. <coughs> so congratulations, you're waking up. This is basically what the wake up is, is that more and more subtle things, and this is one of those at that level of subtlety that mm-hmm. you've arrived to to recognize that, oh yeah, that uh, uh, there's that, that quality of aversion then at that feeling level that will then uh, quite possibly take us into a state of going ahead and doing something uh, because it's supposed to be done or I have been ordered somehow through my own mind to do it. Mm. That in fact that's that attitude then that takes us down into that unsatisfactory uh, state, these woeful states. So this is in fact what the example of this one then would become that animal. I've been setting that up, okay, this is the animal world Mm. of doing what we're told to do because the the aversion to it is there, but I'm going to go do it anyway. But now you're beginning to wake up to that aversion, and by doing that, you're beginning to see how that, that aversion itself drove you into doing things that you've been doing your whole life. And so if you can catch that um, aversion as it comes up, uh, let us say, uh, as you observe it coming up more frequently, not that it comes up more frequently, whatever level is coming up, that's about to start slowing down as your frequency of catching it come up <laughs> increases. And so as you catch it more often, that will mean that now you're becoming uh, more in control of your life because before you did many things ac- according to your aversion. Yep. And that the aversion has a story in it somewhere. And that is the story is if I don't do what I'm told to do, then I'll really feel bad. Yeah. And so I'm going to feel a little bit bad and go ahead and do what I what this feeling of aversion comes from. Now, the issue is somebody can say that to you or you can remember something or whatever and then we'll go into that state of aversion and many times people do it and they don't even recognize that they're there. So they wind up going and doing things out of obligation. Well, what are they obligated to? Well, internally, right at this very instance, they're obligated to deal with this aversion that they know is there, but they're not paying really any attention to. Mm. It's like a woman dealing with a um, uh, a merchant over something, and little Billy is pulling on her mom's dress, I want to go, I got to go, I got to go. And while she's trying our best to ignore that child so that she can deal with the, uh, uh, the merchant through the business, still now she's still shaken up inside and really begins to get in a hurry so that she can deal with this kid that she's trying desperately to avoid while he's trying desperately to get Mm -hmm. her attention. Well, that whole scenario can go on right inside the mind. Yep. Uh, So that we're playing all of the, uh, all of the parts of that game, not, not necessarily the merchant. The merchant is just whatever is on the outside out there. 
but we have this anxiety that is pushing us. And that's that little kid in there who is um, dissatisfied, angry, upset. And the, uh, uh, the mom uh, or the parent ego state is trying to ignore the child because she's trying to keep her set of rules together in the mind. Okay, so uh, that basically what happens in, on an individual's level is we ignore that um, anxiety but we go ahead and behave according to it anyway. Mm -hmm. Because it's subconscious. It's not right up there staring us in the face. It's not slapping us around until we really wake up to it. And then we recognize, okay, right. This lady right this very instant needs to stop playing her game with the merchant and take care of this child right now. Mm -hmm. Find out what it needs and what it wants, okay? And so this is how we're going to start dealing with it in meditation and also, is let's not worry about the job that this uh, anxiety calls us to do. Let's, let's look at exactly uh, this, this feeling directly. Let's go right after the feelings um, of anxiety directly. Or whatever you, you tend to label them. You see, that's the problem is, is that we've got a, a problem with language. Whatever it is that you're actually feeling that is uncomfortable for you, I don't know exactly what that is. Yeah. Exactly. But I have something pretty close, I think, okay? It's like when we both talk about the color green, we both agree that the background behind is green, but we can't uh, agree that but once it gets inside the mind, do we see the same thing or not? Yep. That, that we don't know, okay? And so these actual experiences, we have such a broad language, and many times they don't fit. But we can get it down to the basics, and down to the basics would be uh, unsatisfactory or satisfactory. And so uh, once we wake up, we can wake up to see these feelings of being un dissatisfied. And it's sometimes very subtle. It's mm -hmm. amazing how subtle they are, and yet yeah. they drive our behavior. But now that you're seeing them more clearly, they're not going to be so subtle. Yeah, it's like the more subtle ones. Um, <clears throat> it's like they've just yeah they've just been there for so long or maybe they've they've kept coming up for so long and i've just never really noticed them it's always just been like it's always just been um me i suppose just um the way the way life is experienced mm -hmm. exactly but now it's um there's it's layers Right, and, and not only that, but at this particular layer, this personality trait that you're seeing now is actually not a personality trait. Yeah. It's just an old bad habit. And yeah, exactly. I am not that bad habit. That's, that's beautiful. That's exactly what we're beginning to understand is, is that we are not that which is the experience of just one one bad habit after another or one layer of bad habits after another um, mm. that as we begin to see what's going on we automatically have choices that we didn't have before yeah exactly. and so um, the, the choices that we make one choice is in fact uh, one kind of meditation practice is just let it roll Go ahead and just have that anxiety. Just let it be there. You can see it now. And eventually it'll go away on its own. And then what a relief it is. Yep. With the, with the method of Anapanasati and with our understanding of hindrances that are to be eliminated, it actually feels good when that feeling goes away no matter whether it's there for a long time or a short time, right? The yep. relief is still there, right? Yep. So let's get rid of it right away because we're still going to get the reward of being relieved of it once it's gone. Exactly. 
And just get right back on the breath. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> and this is so... It, it, it's almost mind-boggling for many people to understand that, yes, we can, in fact, once we see something, we can take care of it, uh, of it immediately, right then and there. Whatever it is. And when we start uh, dealing with a reverse um, set of good old whatever it is that keep coming at us one after another and we keep successfully managing to come back to the present moment happily, that's when that sense of uh, real deep security and satisfaction yeah. gets built into it in the form of confidence. Yeah. That of course we can do it. Okay. And that, in fact, we're going to need that level of confidence um, when it comes time uh, later in one's practice, when we recognize that this is, this is a marvelous Dhamma that has been given. This is an enormously beneficial uh, thing, a gift I, that I have received. Thank you for that, Vicar Buddha Das, I must say. But if he had given me $10 million in gold way back when in 1983 or whatever, as opposed to giving me the Dhamma, I think I wouldn't have all of that gold today. I would have squandered <laughs> it and been miserable. But I'm doing just happy. Thank you. Without that gold. That this is such a marvelous gift. And part of the gift has to do then with uh, the willingness of it to, to share is part of the compassion we have for the world. Let's mm. share this wonderful Dhamma. Okay, that's actually then uh, one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves. Do I know what's going on inside of my own mind well enough to show that to other people so that they can see it too? Because some of these things are really subtle. But we can transmit the Dhamma, one person to another. I don't so know I've been so trying to do that. Groups. Excellent, right. So we're already involved in it. What you doing? Um, so one thing is when, when people come and they kind of, they, they try to bring me into the, into the negativity that they're feeling like they may see something on the news or they may not like something about someone else and they'll come and you know complain about it to me I, I kind of just I, I just stay silent and I, I, I don't really I don't really react and I kind of try to find a way to change the tone of the situation good good um and just trying to be, you know, just trying to be happy myself so I don't really bring anyone else down and I can bring them up. Well, now you're understanding what I'm talking about, or at least you're telling me about it. In fact, we should have a whole talk on this. This is actually the Pali word that we're speaking of is mudita, mm -hmm. which is basically how to change the situation through our own vibration. Okay, that things sympathetically vibrate. Yeah. By the way, I have just seen that in action. Oh? Right right here, yeah. We've got a four-year-old boy who has come to the house often with his mom because she's friends with uh, the family and she's got an older sister that plays with uh, uh, Kitty. So that's mm -hmm. the situation. And every time he comes, he's quite afraid of the dog. Right. Okay. And that uh, I, I have been slowly guiding and move, maneuvering things, but yet I recognize that it wasn't right yet until Tam. Tam was the one who got him close enough to the dogs, and she started to... Um, Hello. She tarted, started to pet the dog. Once this boy touched that dog, for more than 10 minutes, he did not take his hands off that dog. Oh, he nice. Oh, so. Yes, exactly. And now he's back with the dog again right now. 
Um, both of them, in fact, both dogs. He's uh, he's been petting. That's uh, great. So it's a, it's a marvelous thing to see that, in fact, <clears throat> we can get him out of his fear mm. and uh, and into the into the friendship. And so that was what Tam was able to do. She was able to get him to to actually touch and pet the dog. He's going to have a lot of fun now. Right. <laughs> so this is exactly the kind of thing that we're that we're talking about. Just between a child um, coming out of his fear and uh, becoming friendly with a dog, that is exactly um, the kind of thing that can happen between individuals easily when you greet them with your joy. Mm. And this is this is called the mudita. You're helping them out. Oh yes, exactly. Everybody needs a, um, everybody needs somebody sometime, especially if that new somebody has a smile. Mm. <laughs> uh, which is now becoming part of the practice is part of the goal of the practice and it also winds up being the responsibility then to share the Dhamma even if we share nothing more than a smile. Mm. Yeah, I see that. Okay. So, um, but there is deeper work that can be done. Mm -hmm. That organizations and, and branching out with friendships and all of that kind of thing. Uh, so, uh, there becomes sort of, as we become dedicated to the Dhamma, like we were talking about yesterday, part of that dedication also has to do with not just, uh, hearing the Dhamma from someone else or reminding ourselves of it, but also to, to talk about it, to share the Dhamma, to spread the Dhamma, to tell others of, uh, uh, even though it's subtle and some and sometimes a little bit complicated, there's basically only just one thing, and that is you've got the choice to be in the state of dissatisfaction. Yeah. You can change it in the state of being satisfied. The choice is always the choice. And so teaching them at least that they've got that choice. You can be you can be happy now. You don't have to be unhappy. Yep. So, back to then the, the practice. This actually requires a lion to do. Because normally, as ordinary people, we will join into whatever the herd feels. Whatever the herd is, like the new environment, whenever someone new comes into an environment, he has to fit into that environment yeah. and kind of go along to get along. Okay. Yep. Only a lion can walk in there and do what he wants to do anyway. Mm. And so that's the, the change of mentality, is, is that you become really, really strong so that you can see what's going on around you and spread joy. That in fact, um, recently one of my friends was talking about a situation at work and, and the advice that we talked about was this, that there are basically three groups, two groups fighting with each other for control of a weak boss. Those are the three groups that she's got to deal with, okay? Oh, wow. And, and her, the answer is, is to make friends with everybody. And she talks about the situation that needs to be fixed and says, it's not your job to fix the situation. Your job is to be friends with everybody. Mm. Each and every one individual because your opinions will matter more if each one trusts you. Yeah, exactly. But you got to get that trust and that friendship going first. 
There's and a suitor on that, I think. Um, uh, MN135, I think. I'm not sure. Um, what? Tell me about it. It just, um, you know, it says things like, those those who are bitter, if if they're born into the human realm, they um they are ugly. But those who are not bitter, if they are born into the human realm, they are beautiful. If those um those who are who are envious, if they're born into the human realm, they are uninfluential. But those who are not envious, if they're born into the human realm, they are influential. Um. That kind of wow, stuff. that sounds like what I'm talking about, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So the lion is one who is free from jealousy. So mm. if we walk into an organization jealous, then we will fit in with all of the other people in that organization who are jealous. Mm. And everyone winds up being jealous of everyone else. Yeah. Funny thing, the higher they get in the organization, the more jealous they get. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now, here we can say jealous or, or in the sense of guarding what I have to make sure that he doesn't take it away, which mm. is exactly what the wife feels when the new girl comes by. Yeah. Okay. So jealousy actually is, uh, is most vicious at the top. <laughs> yeah, I bet. So they have the most to lose. Um... And the beginners don't know enough about what's going on to know what to be jealous of yet. All they have is their jealousy. Mm -hmm. And so attitude coming into a new organization or just changing your own attitude in the organization that you're in is going to have an influence on that organization. Yep. Definitely. Uh, Especially if you begin to understand that that's, that's actually a more important job than whatever your job is, is in the doing. That that's actually secondary. The important yeah, job actually. is that to be friends with everybody. Yeah, that's so true now you mention it. Rather than uh, becoming a part of any faction or anything. Um, this is part of the reason why um, hmm, friendship is the whole of the path, so the Buddha says, rather than, uh, and this comes out of this half sutta where Ananda says that he's heard from Sariputta that friendship is half the, uh, the path, and the Buddha says, no, it's the whole path. Hmm. Okay, how can that be? The answer is that um, we see the whole world is friendly, which means now there's nothing to be afraid of because everything around is, is friendly. Mm. And uh, there is no uh, animosity towards anything, which means I'm not out there doing things that are going to create animosity anywhere else. Yeah. And so this whole quality of friendship has to do then with a high quality of morality. Because we don't harm other people, not our friends anyway. Mm. Except that everybody's their friend, so. <laughs> and so our, our morality uh, becomes very high quality when we see everything uh, through the eyes of a friendship. So, like, uh, I think when Jesus was saying something like, uh, turn the other cheek, and it was actually quite long in the description, he mm -hmm. was actually talking about is perhaps uh, to, to give him a smile, but you need to give him a smile long before he slaps you. Don't get it to the point that this guy's going to slug you. Things have gone a little too far by then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's too late. Right, it's almost too late. The violence has already come. Uh, <clears throat> but the point is correct. Don't return violence with violence. 
but now we at a much more sophisticated way we can understand to not return anything but friendship mm -hmm. because anything else can be perceived as violence and then things start to escalate mm -hmm. so things don't have to escalate because we're not adding any fuel to that fire all we're doing exactly. is um, is having fun with it. So uh, this then uh, requires that friend that we have within ourselves actually comes out of that attitude that I can become friends with anyone. That I don't see any reason to be afraid of anybody. This is now where that quality of a lion comes in. We can only mm. be friends with people once we have uh, that uh, change of attitude of being uh, a winner, not superior to other people, but rather yeah. superior to what I used to be. Yeah. And so we're not afraid of anyone. There's nothing he can say that's going to uh, shake my boat. I need to keep that in mind, I think. Um, because... I always, I always wanted to be superior to others because of my anxiety. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's something that's something to um, always keep in mind. Yeah. So, uh, in in a way, um, it's almost an oxymoron in the sense of ordinary versus special that only a very special person can see himself as ordinary. Everybody else goes around seeing themselves as special. Yeah. And because so many of them see themselves as special, that's quite ordinary. Yeah. Yep. But when we recognize it, that in fact, that it's not me and it's not mine, that it's Dhamma. Mm. And that the only thing that is me and mine in there is the determination to follow that Dhamma. But the Dhamma itself is working. It is a working system that I haven't seen much anywhere else. Mm. And so it's not me that's being sold. <clears throat> it's the Dhamma. If there's anything, I'm I'm not even the product. I'm just a free sample. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, so this is the way that we think of it in the sense of, yes, we do need to deal with that anxiety from the perspective of, yeah, I can do it. I can handle that. I can actually become friends with that tension or anxiety or that uncomfortableness mm. rather than having it run the life. It doesn't have to run mm. your life. Exactly. But there's no reason to try to kill it. We can just kind of put it in its place. Just, you know, settle down. I got you covered, you know. Mm. Yeah. Sort of that happy... Uh, uh, friendly way of saying aha I caught you yeah mm. there you are it's kind of like when when all these kind of states come that these unsatisfactory states come it's like in the past I'd feel trapped by them like there's no way out but now I feel like there's always a back door just have to realize what's going on in another way of thinking, saying it though no this 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 new feeling is what snuck in the back door you still have the front wide open <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> that's even better yeah <laughs> yes uh, having a back door to sneak out of is sort of like the uh, uh, the victim's um, out. Oh yeah. The back door, the consolation prize, rather than oh no, I'm I'm the winner here. I'm I'm <laughs> I 
am not the victim of this stuff. That is that which has got to go back out the back door. And yep. we, we, we're going to maintain the, uh, the authority within this uh, um, uh, noble temple of God. All right. Now that is... Okay, yeah, so now that's going to go back out the back door. Not me. Great. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That hindrance or that anxiety or that, uh, uh, that, that feeling. And when it does slither on back out the back door, that's relief. Wow, I'm glad it's gone. Yeah. And so there's where that relief comes in. Okay, the anxiety then and then the relief. It's, it, the relief is when it's going to go away. The question is, when is it going to go away? Is it going to go away as soon as it's caught? Or are you going to let it strap you by the leg for a while? Yep. Yeah. But it will go away. It's not going to. Everything is temporary. Even feelings of anxiety, they come and they go. Mm. And um, there are complex relationships and reasons why that stuff comes and goes. But generally, it comes when it has an opportunity to come. Something will trigger it, and then it will come up. Mm -hmm. But that happens with every every bad feeling that we have, and. We can notice that bad feeling because we actually can control the way that we feel. And this is the way that we do it, is by always going back into that feeling of relief once we catch that critter and let it go back out the back door. Mm. But there's a place for pets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... But having, but gnawing on our leg is not one of the places for the best. Nope. And so they, these metaphors are um, around, built around the idea of the back door. And that's actually um, taking the winner's position. Mm. Always is to let these guys settle down. We can't kill our fear or our anxiety. We don't even want to. Because there may come a time when being a little bit afraid is going to wake us up to where we can see what's going on. Yeah. That is a, it's a protective mechanism, and it's what kept us alive all of this time, so we're not going to completely destroy it. Well, we are going to take control of it. Mm -hmm. So that we can feel kind of the way that we want to. And each time we do is when we catch that feeling in a powerful enough way that we can say, okay, out. Mm. And that's basically the, the, the whole uh, core then of the teaching is, is that you can, in fact, have the thoughts that you want to think. And yeah. you don't have to have the thoughts that you don't want to think. Yep. got that choice that's excellent yeah it's great how um, how you just need to remember it that's what sati is all about you're right, right. that's uh, now you're seeing why that's so important if we can't remember to come out of our suffering we're not going to <laughs> exactly but if we do remember that this is a bunch of crap that I'm doing right now, that I can't, and or at least wake up to see what I'm doing right now and recognizing what it is, then we can deal with it. Mm. But it's not wise to wake up to it just to recognize that this is just wandering thoughts and let the mind wander, or to recognize even that this is anxiety. Let me see here, sit here and research it as anxiety. Because it's, it eventually is going to go away. Mm. Anyway. When, when's it going to go away? Probably right after you started clinging to it. Oh, my anxiety. I want to really get this anxiety in. <laughs> then it's gone. <laughs> ah, where's my anxiety? <laughs> <laughs> but the better way is to begin to take control of one's mind. 
to see that stuff and say, I don't have to deal with that. I can do something else instead. Mm -hmm. And by learning to do that, over and over again mentally, we can actually begin to do it at the feeling level, which is actually where we're beginning to work now. Yeah. And that is, is that you can not only control the thought, because we can learn to control the breathing, we're now learning to control the thought, and by learning to control the thought, now you're beginning to see the feelings that are underlying them, and that's that's brought on. That's the place right. you ought to be. So now you can start adding to that the fact that you don't have to feel that way. You can feel the way you want to, just like you were able to change the, the thought in the mind from a, a worry thought into a happy thought. Now you mm -hmm. can change the feeling from a worry feeling into a happy feeling. Yeah. An example is uh, worrying about going to the bank. Yeah. Oh, I've got to do this, and I've got that account over there, and this thing over there, and all of that. Guess what? If I'm not actually going to the bank right now, why should I even think about what I need? Exactly. In fact, it's all in, a, in the same pile in there. If I grab that pile when I go to the bank, then everything will be okay. <laughs> and so I don't have to think about it at all. But most people, when they have to do something, they'll think and plan and advance mm. and, and and go into that kind of thing uh, because they're Rumination. looking for security. They want to feel resolved about it, except that they still haven't gone to the bank. So the next time exactly. they think about the bank, they got to go through the process again to feel secure about it again. Yeah. So it's like you think about the bank. And then you don't like it, so you start planning, and then you feel okay, and then it goes away, and then it comes back again, and that keeps uh -huh. happening. Uh-huh, and that samsara takes another turn, the wheel. Every time we think about the bank, or uh, we feel insecure, we plan on what we need to do at the bank. After we go through the cycle of all we need to do, did I make sure I got it? Yeah, there are five points, I got it. Ah, and now I can relax. <laughs> Yeah, that's basically, it's it's stress. And we re-stress ourselves every time until we recognize, you know, I don't have to think about going to the bank. I yeah. can put those kind of thoughts aside. And I can think about only the things that are happening right now. Because there's not really, as far as verbiage goes, there's not really a lot to talk about what's happening right now. So there's not a lot of thinking going on. Now, there's a really a lot of stuff happening right now. I mean, you wouldn't believe how much of a dance that one tree limb can make with all of those leaves. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you couldn't talk about it at the speed that all of that stuff is happening. But the mind can settle into just the, the full overall understanding of, yeah, tree leaves are uh, dancing. <laughs> uh, and so we don't have to think about the bank mm. it's not here, I'm not going to the bank today there's nothing to do and no place to go and so we begin to understand that that's the way of almost all of the thoughts that we have are repetitive mm. thoughts of the same old stuff that goes through that little cycle of, oh, i got a job to do, let me think about what i got to do, and now that I've thought about what I've got to do, I feel better about it. When the easy thing to do is, oh, wait a minute, I, I don't feel good. Is it the bank? Out of here, bank. And, mm -hmm. and take your uh, unsatisfied feeling away with you. <laughs> okay. And so uh, we begin to see that we don't have to think about a lot of stuff, and so thinking actually becomes quite less and less. There's not really a lot worth thinking about. Yeah. And then you just start feeling good. And that feels really good when there's nothing to think about. There's nothing that wor is so worrisome that we even have to think about it, because there's nothing worth uh -huh. thinking about. <laughs> And so in that way, again, we're becoming more friends with ourselves, is to, uh, you know, put the mind in neutral and turn the motor off. Mm. 
let everything cool off a while. And in that regard, what I'm meaning in the, uh, is that we normally have five senses that we don't pay as much attention to. We do. We do a lot. But basically what we do with the eyes is we see something, and what and instead of seeing everything, we see something, an object. And now we have to process to figure out what that object is, and now we have to go and act upon it. Yeah. Okay, so that figuring out what it is is actually the mental process now that I'm talking about. If we just let things come in as senses, without having to figure out what it is, just let it be, so you feel secure enough that you don't have to figure it out to find out if it's dangerous or not. Mm. Just let it be. By, by doing that way, now we're living completely within the senses and we're not living in that m mental processing show that, uh, that goes and rolls on in the mind. I was doing something sort of similar to that um, over the weekend. Um, and it was, it was kind of like I could split up experience between you know what I was seeing and what I was hearing like there were separate things it wasn't like one solid experience um which is what I had read about in the past but never really sort of you know so you could say it almost in the uh, way of the experience of the senses and then the story we tell ourselves the ongoing story about yeah what we're experiencing in our senses, right, okay. And we don't have to even do that much. We don't have to let that that roll on. When we can see that, we can say, yeah, there it is. Yeah. And then we can spend more time in, in the sense world. And by going in off into the sense world, that's when... The exhilaration of actually becoming part of reality. Because in the senses, we're actually experiencing and working directly with reality. But right. normally, we as humans, we live off the story we tell ourselves about reality. Yeah. So you're sort of, you're just, you're just there, you're just in the moment. Mm hmm And so how we begin to to work with that is by beginning to choose what what thoughts are wholesome and what thoughts are unwholesome so that we dispense with the unwholesome and now the wholesome thoughts we're having is about the here now with all the sensory input and then we begin to say wait a minute I don't have to have all of that thinking about what's going on I can just be here for what's going on instead <laughs> yeah that I don't have to tell myself stories about the tree out there and just enjoy the tree. Yeah. And so this is the way that we're beginning to see all of this anxiety and all of these thoughts and becoming back to the wholesome. So having more and more thoughts about what's happening in the here now will start to limit those thoughts. You can begin to see them more directly and more more clearly. Mm. It's just you know, kind of running dialogue. Not terrible. It's just a little bit of work to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is the way then we practice. And it does take that knowing lion's attitude that we can do this, we can do this, we mm. can, in fact, clean the mind out. We can come back to this present moment. We can come back to this present moment. And so in the beginning, we bring the mind back to this present moment. Uh, uh, let us call it at least unwash due to the fact that it's just taking a mud bath with hindrances. <laughs> but over time, very short time, clean uh, it out. 
yeah, it begins to even clean out that that part of it, so that uh, uh, we can become uh, quite alert to the to those hindrances coming back. Mm. Okay, and so uh, that's the focus also of the mind of what it what's what is it that's worthwhile thinking about is the question here. The answer is making sure that the hindrances don't come back. So actually talking about hindrances, or as we catch them, we can describe them, oh yeah, that's a hindrance, I got you, and out you go. Yeah. All right. But once you get to the point where you've got no hindrances in the mind, now we can spend all of the thought process that we have into the thoughts that are occurring around us. Especially the thoughts about, oh, this is so nice. Oh, I really enjoy that, uh, the, the breeze. Oh, the weight of the chair is good. You know, I feel comfortable in uh, sitting. Um, okay. And so we kind of become expansive in the sense that we really enjoy this present moment. Mm. And, and allow those kind of thoughts. So that we begin to get really comfortable at only having thoughts about this, the here now. Mm. And, and then we can begin to recognize that, wait a minute, now that I've got the mind down to the point that it's only having thoughts about the here now, I can see even that is a bit of work that I don't really have to do so much of. And I can spend more and more time just experiencing the here now without having to give myself a running story about it. Now this is one of the ways of naturally going into second jhana. Mm -hmm. Or you can actually physically limit the mind in the sense of bringing it down by uh, degrees so that you only allow certain things in the mind down to say one particular sutta or one particular passage, and then down to maybe just a mantra. And then finally you bring it down to nothing. That's the second method, but the, the method that we're talking about here is more of the natural method rather mm -hmm. than the uh, organized method of continuing to live it to mind. But here we're going to be limiting the mind by recognizing each one of those thoughts as they come up is, I don't have to think that. <laughs> I don't have to think that thought. I'd be better off just not thinking anything at all. That's even more pleasant. <laughs> mm. Yep. So I hope that you've enjoyed this conversation we've had today about this. This is um, a way of looking great. at how it how is going to be progressing for you especially in the sense of dealing with the anxieties or the uncomfortable situations that we talked about at the first part of the talk. Mm. That we can move from their own by, beyond, oh yeah, I don't have to feel that way, is how you can start. And eventually it's going to come, oh yeah, I don't even have to think that thought either, as nice and pleasant as it is, I don't even have to think it either. <laughs> So we'll see you later. This has been great. Been see you later, Damarato.